Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar today entitled, Is Your Child a Target of Bullying, Bullying and Harassment? We will begin our webinar at this time. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the question box. I will be your presenter today. If you're having any technical difficulties, please let me know. Bullying has been a very important topic um, lately and has been in the news quite often lately. So this, I believe, is a very timely presentation. Many parents have directly experienced that a child with a disability often faces obstacles in accessing educational opportunities. Bullying can intensify those challenges. Bullies tend to target children who are considered different. It may be their appearance, the way they communicate, or the manner in which they behave. The fear of being bullied at school can greatly diminish a child's ability to learn. Without intervention, children with disabilities who are the targets of bullying may be deprived of their legal right to a free, appropriate public education. They are also at risk for short and long-term effects such as school avoidance, low self-esteem, increased fear of anxiety, depression, lower grades, and increased violence in the school. Bullying is a serious issue that affects nearly every school in our nation. It is a behavior that knows no boundaries of race, class, gender, size of school, or age. On your screen presently, are some of the outcomes of bullying, and they're listed there for you. And we've just discussed some of those. Moving on to a definition of bullying, the United States Department of Education defines bullying as intentional, repeated, hurtful acts, words or other behaviors such as name calling, threatening, and or shunning committed by one or more children against another. In order to develop intervention strategies, bullying behavior needs first needs to be defined. Parents need to be able to know and recognize it when they see it. One or more of these characteristics needs to be present in order to distinguish the behavior as bullying. First, intentional behavior toward a target. The target does not knowingly provoke the bully, and the target may have made it clear that he or she resents that behavior. Bullying can often be and often be repetitive. Actions are generally carried out repeatedly over time, but could also be a single incident. The third uh, area here that we are going to be discussing is hurtful acts, words, or other behavior. An oppressive or negative act carried out against another with the intent to hurt or harm. And again, the key word here is intent. Fourthly, the bullying behavior needs to be committed by one or more persons against another. Bullying can be the act of a single person or can be done by groups. And fifthly, there needs to be a presence of real or perceived imbalance of power. A child without power cannot bully. Power can be defined as either physical strength, social status, or a higher sense of self-esteem. Moving on to the definition of disability harassment, and it's on your screen in front of you at this time. When harassing conduct is sufficiently severe, persistent, or pervasive so that it creates a hostile environment, it can violate a student's rights under Section 504 and Title II regulations. The agencies conclude that a hostile environment may exist even if there are no tangible effects on the student where the harassment is serious enough to adversely affect the student's ability to participate in or benefit from their educational program. 
And again, the definition is displayed on that slide for you. There are many common views about bullying. In spite of the significant impact that bullying can have on a target, it continues to be viewed as acceptable behavior in many instances. There are many misperceptions that adults may have about bullying, and a few of them are listed there on the slide in front of you. The first one, boys will be boys. The implication is that bullying is okay and that it's natural for boys to be physically or verbally aggressive. However, research indicates aggression is a learned behavior, not a natural response. The second one listed on your slide is girls don't bully. Research shows that girls can and do bully. While they do not physically bully as often as boys, they may use verbal and social bullying more often. Bullying for girls escalates during the middle school years. The third common view listed on your slide is words will never hurt you. Studies have shown even though words don't leave bruises or broken bones, they may leave deep emotional scars that are lifelong indications and implications. Children learn at a very early age that words can hurt other children. Nextly, some people deserve to be bullying. Bullying is a natural part of childhood. This is also considered to be a misperception. There is nothing natural about bullying, being bullied. Bullying is often considered a normal part of childhood because it is a common experience. Physical or emotional aggression toward others should not be tolerated as a consequence of childhood. The statement here, some people deserve to be, uh, to be bullied. No child's behavior merits being hurt or harmed in any way, shape, or manner. The next statement, bullying will make kids tough. Bullying does not make someone tougher. Research has shown it often has the opposite effect. Lowering a child's sense of self-esteem and self-worth is what could be a result of this particular situation. Bullying often creates fear and it increases anxiety in children. And the last one on this slide is a common view about bullying is it was only teasing. Most children are occasionally teased. Teasing in which the parties are not hurt is not considered bullying. Teasing is bullying when a child with a disability does not understand they are being teased and the intent of the action is to hurt or to harm. Our next slide talks about children who actually bully. How would you describe the typical bully? Traditionally, children who bully were perceived as someone large in stature. In reality, a bully is defined by his or her behavior. Bullies can be any size, any race, any religion, any gender. They can be popular or rejected by in-groups or social circles. There are many reasons why children bully. The most predominant is that the child's inability to manage his or her anger or frustration in an appropriate manner might be the cause. Children who bully seek to demonstrate power. They are aggressive, physically stronger, remorseful, and intentional in wanting to harm others. They may also thrive on control and dominance and often cannot distinguish between fear and respect. Children who bully frequently have a false sense of self-worth. They might have a large circle of friends, and this social status is something reached by forcing children to befriend them out of fear. The so-called friends of the bully fear becoming targets themselves. Research shows that bullying can begin as early as preschool. It's increased in elementary. It peaks in middle school 
and then hopefully it decreases in high school, although there have been many, many instances of decreasing or increasing high school um, bullying. In elementary school, boys are more involved than girls in bullying. This gender difference decreases in middle school to high school as social bullying among girls increases. Boys generally bully both boys and girls, while girls usually bully other girls. Bullying behavior in elementary school is more likely to include physical aggression, while middle and high school bullying is more characterized by teasing and social exclusion. And just as a caveat that's not necessarily included at this point in your slides, there is an increase in cyberbullying both in the middle school and in the high school years. Also, boys tend to use physical means to bully, while girls tend to use teasing, social exclusion, and also cyberbullying. Moving on to our next slide, children who are targets of bullying will be discussed. The words we use to describe bullying are very important and very powerful. Children who are bullied are often referred to as victims. This term implies that the child is powerless to change his or her situation or that he or she is somehow responsible for the action of someone else. However, children who are bullied are really targets and they do not have power. With help from parents and school staff, they can gain power and can change what is happening to them. No matter what term is used, however, a victim or a target is absolutely not responsible for the actions of the bully against him or her. However, using the word target may change the thinking too. I was hurt. The bully made target practice out of me, but I have choices and I have options. I can take back some power. By using the word target, a witness can see that a child as picked on intentionally is someone making a decision to hurt that person. And that person can say, I will help make plans to keep it from happening again. Children with disabilities who are targeted can learn strategies to help them take power back from the bullies. They may learn a different way to respond or to react. They may learn to ignore or to give a witty response. We will talk more about these strategies a little bit later in our presentation. The following are some examples of common characteristics of children who are targeted by bullies. Children who display vulnerable behaviors. These are children who lack an appropriate response to the bully's behavior or become visually frightened. This type of reaction perpetuates the bullying as it provides the bully with a desired outcome. Secondly, children who have few or no close friends or peers and are often socially isolated. These children with even a single peer are less likely to become a target of bullying. Peers are more likely to help one another in times of need and bullies recognize the vulnerability of an isolated child. Children who are less assertive may also seem to be weak or easily dominated, and also children with a lower sense of self-worth, self-esteem, and confidence may also find to be a target of bullying. There are many types of bullying, and we will be talking about the different types of bullying um, in the next couple of slides. Bullying behavior can be broken down into basically four categories, physical, verbal, emotional, and sexual. Sometimes physical bullying can be the easiest type of bullying to recognize it is the, as it is the most visible. However, because the majority of physical bullying occurs outside the views of adults, sometimes it is difficult to detect. 
Physical bullying includes hitting, kicking, pushing, taking or damaging of someone's property, forcing or some sort of unwelcomed contact. It also includes the perceived intent of harm, which can include instances of pretending to physically harm the target, such as flinching or flicking your fingers in front of somebody's eyes. It can also include spitting, pulling hair, and throwing objects. Physical bullying episodes can be brief in duration, but they have consequences that they extend far behind the immediate hurt and harm because the target may now feel unsafe at school. Physical bullying can begin in children as young as four and five years old. This behavior is not considered bullying until the child realizes his or her actions cause another's pain. Physical behavior is more often perpetuated by boys against boys, but girls can also be subjected to biting, hitting, kicking on the playground, in school, or on the way home to school from school. And um, again, on your slide is a display of some types of physical bullying. Moving on to the second type of bullying, and that is verbal bullying. Verbal bullying is the most common type and can easily um, inflict on other children harm. It is quick and it is easy. It includes things like teasing, name calling, threats against the target, intimidation, demeaning jokes about another's differences, spreading rumors, gossiping, slander. Children at a very early age learn how to verbally bully other children. It begins with name calling, usually using words that are forbidden or unacceptable to adults. As a child matures, they begin to understand how much words can be used to hurt others. Boys generally like to name call and also use threats, while girls use things like slander and gossip to gain social power. Generally, verbal bullying peaks in middle school and begins to decrease as children become more socially conscious and accept the differences of others. Now, in this area, we could also place cyberbullying. There's no physical part to cyberbullying, but there are, of course, many verbal parts to cyberbullying. With respect to teasing, it is important to distinguish the difference between good-natured fun and bullying. For example, a target of playful teasing reacts with a smile or a laugh, and both parties are building social contact and awareness. The parties are engaged in a mutual interaction and have what we call equal power. The target of hurtful teasing, otherwise bullying, can become hurt, angry, or sad. The differences between teasing and bullying is in the intent of the child intimidating the behavior or initiating the behavior and the reaction to that behavior. While some teasing may appear good-natured, it becomes or may become hurtful for a child. The child initiating the action may be familiar with the message of how to push someone's buttons and in doing so may change from regular good-hearted fun to teasing and then to bullying. The third type of bullying is now displayed on your screen. That is emotional bullying and the list of emotional bullying are also included uh, in that list. Emotional or social bullying is the, the most sophisticated of all bullying as it is generally very deliberate and is often done in groups. It can be the most difficult type of bullying for children to define as bullying be because um, they often feel as if they did something to deserve this kind of action or they do not understand why it is happening to them. So some examples of social bullying would include alienation or exclusion from groups. Children with disabilities often want to be a part of a group and work hard to try to fit in and to not be judged as different from their peers.
The second statement on your slide, manipulation done to prevent acceptance into groups, includes such things as gossiping or making defamatory statements about another child. Damage to one's reputation includes telling negative stories about another person in order to infatuate or to inflate one's own self-esteem. Public humiliation is making fun of the appearance or the behavior of another. Creating a sense of unease for that target is making that target feel vulnerable and unsafe. And flaming is posting slander on the internet, or what we would basically call at this point, also again, cyberbullying. So as we said before, cyberbullying can go across several categories. Emotional abuse peaks in middle school as children are learning about social norms and standards and finding out what fits in social hierarchy. The behavior becomes bullying when the intent is to cause another pain or to assert social dominance. So again, um, intent is the key word here. One of the last examples of bullying that we'll be talking about today is types of bullying, under types of bullying is sexual bullying. Understandably, this may be the most difficult type of bullying for a child to discuss and also is difficult for a parent to hear. Some examples of sexual bullying include sexually charged comments, inappropriate or lewd glances, inappropriate physical contact, exhibitionism, and sexual assault. Children need to be provided with the appropriate social rules and norms for dating and for flirting so that they can act with respect toward their peers and recognize when someone is not respecting them sexually. Children need to know what are acceptable boundaries. So this is a discussion that um, I would suggest that every parent have with their children. And if there are children that have difficulty with the understanding of some of these uh, norms, then I would suggest that the parent work with school um, administrators and school teachers to be able to provide some of this information for children who have a hard time with understanding. Your child may not be a target of bullying right now, but may that may change in the future. In the future, their potential for becoming a target may increase. It is important to recognize a child's potential as a target and to develop a plan to provide a child with disabilities with the skills and the strategies to avoid bullying behavior. This should be started when your child is young. And on the slide, it lists for you some things that you might want to do in planning ahead. Firstly, to teach your child about self-advocacy skills. It is my belief that every child who has an IEP should also have a self-advocacy plan included in their IEP. Secondly, to teach the child independent problem-solving methods. If they are able to problem-solve on their own, they will have more of a chance of being able to defend themselves toward unwanted bullying. Help your child understand their disability and the ways to communicate with others this understanding with their peers. The more knowledge your child has of their particular disability, the more apt they are to be able to communicate their disability with others. We should encourage social development and peer relationships. Having friends and learning social skills are important steps in reducing a child's vulnerability toward bullying behavior. You should use your child's IEP to develop goals and objectives to prevent becoming a target. Also, please begin to watch for gaps in social skills or knowledge of social norms. As a parent, you would want to create a framework for guiding your child's social development and well-being. So, 
I think developing your plans should start, of course, with talking with your child about bullying. And there are some steps listed on this slide for doing so. So how a parent can know if a child is a target of bullying. Some children are able to talk to their parents, but sometimes children are afraid or unable to talk to their parents. What we as parents need to do is to watch for any changes in a child's behavior. These changes may include such things as wanting to stay home from school, unexplained stomach aches or headaches, unexplained bruises, torn clothing, a change in sleep routines, or some sort of change in temperament. Parents can prepare themselves to talk with their children by considering how they are going to handle their child's questions and some of their emotions. A child needs information about differences between friendly behavior and what we know as bullying behavior. The basic rule is let the child know if the behavior hurts or harms them, either emotionally or physically. If so, this is considered to be bullying. So on your list, let's talk about each of those areas. For example, listen. It is the child's story. Let him or her tell it. They may be emotion in emotional pain, and it is important to be able to listen to what they say. Believe what they tell you. The knowledge that a child is being bullied can be shocking. To be an effective advocate, Parents need to react in a way that encourages their child's trust. You need to be supportive as a parent, and I don't think I need to tell parents that very often. We need to tell the child that it is not their fault and that he or she does not deserve to be bullied. Parents need to empower their child by telling them how terrific he or she is. Parents need to avoid judgmental comments about their child or the child who bullies. Their child may already be feeling isolated, and hearing negative statements from parents may only isolate them more. It is important for parents to be patient. Children may not be ready to open up right away. Talking about bullying may be difficult as they may fear retaliation from the bully or think that if they tell an adult that nothing will change. The child may be feeling insecure, withdrawn, frightened or shamed. To provide information for your child, parents are our best educators. Children should, our parents should educate their children about bullying by providing information at a level that the child can understand. And our last um, area under talking with our child is to explore options for intervention strategies. Parents can discuss with their child or discuss with their child options that may have a dealing um, with bullying behavior. And there are multiple examples that I think that all of us would be able to provide in that area. So our next slide moves on to questions to ask your child as you're developing a plan and as you're wanting to find out more about bullying. Parents can help their child recognize bullying behavior by asking the questions that are listed on the screen in front of you. Did the child hurt you on purpose? Was it done more than once? Did it make you feel bad or angry, or how do you feel about the behavior? Did the child know you were being hurt? And is the other child more powerful? Is he like bigger or scarier than you in some way? There are also variations of these questions to ask and different ways or situations that you can question. For example, how was the bus ride home today? Who did you sit, to, sit next to at lunch? I noticed that you're feeling kind of sick a lot and wanting to stay home. Please tell me about that. Are there kids making fun of you? Are there a lot of cliques in school? What do you think about them? Has anyone touched you in a way that you don't like or that makes you feel uncomfortable? There are also other options for helping children discuss bullying that include such things as reading stories while, where the child is uh, in, put into bullying situations, talking about recent events in the news, and discussing bullying incidents on TV or in a movie.
Our next slide talks about deciding appropriate strategies, and some of the strategies are listed there for you. Intervention strategies for a child who is the target of bullying are dependent on not giving the bully the desired response of causing hurt or harm mentally or physically. Strategies that involve direct interaction between a bully and the child should, when possible, be avoided in situations which the bullying is very intense, relentless, or the child feels physically threatened. In talking with your child about options for reacting to bullying, parents need to decide if the intervention is appropriate. For example, in a situation, what is the na nature of the bullying? Will the child be safe in carrying out the intervention? And how long has the teasing been going on? Our next uh, strategy involves the age of the child. Is the intervention appropriate for this particular age of the child? If it is not, find an intervention strategy that's age appropriate. The child's ability and conf uh, comfort level. Does the child have skills and abilities to carry out the strategy? So both the age of the child and the child's ability and comfort level are things to take into consideration. Also, the last one on your slide, the supports available for the child. Does the child have formal um, types of, of supports, like for example, school personnel, or such informal ones as friends and peers to help with these strategies? When a child is the target of bullying behavior, he or she needs to have methods to react to the bullying situations. These reactions fall under two categories, both indirect and direct, which will both be addressed in the following slides. So here are some indirect methods of bullying. And they're on your slide in front of you. And these are reactions to bullying as an indirect method. Indirect reactions are those strategies of not directly responding to the bully. The child may ultimately avoid the situation or not provide the bully with an opportunity to initiate or to continue the behavior. And listed for you are some particular strategies that you might want to bring into the discussion. Disregard the, the bully. Try not to give the bully an emotional response. Try not to cry, become angry, or to act scared. Let the child know that teasing or bullying cannot be prevented and the children cannot control what others say. However, they can learn to control their reactions toward the bully. Use such things as self-talk. Practice with the child methods that you think would be good for a situation. Instill the importance of acknowledging that just because someone says words about you or unfairly does something to you that you do not like, you do have choices. I do not have to behave or believe what they say, and they do not have a right to hurt me. The third one is practice role playing and problem solving. You should work with the child to develop strategies and to establish responses to particular situations. When practicing the response, it is important that the child can easily be able to do this by themselves. Moving on to the next um, reaction to bullying that may be considered to be indirect, move away from the situation. As soon as a child recognizes the potential for bullying, he or she should move away from that situation. And please find help for that child in deciding what to do in that case. Move away physically or maybe talk with another child if a child is in close proximity. Um, the last one on your slide says, stay with a peer. When a child knows that bullying occurs in certain places, for example, in a deserted hallway or on the playground, they should develop a plan that enables them to avoid those places. The child should always stay in the view of an adult. 
Research shows that bullies are more likely to target children when they are alone. So now we're going to move on to a discussion of the reactions to bullying as they relate to direct reactions to bullying. Direct reactions are strategies when the child or the target chooses to directly respond to a bullying situation to ultimately stop the immediate bullying and to prevent it from happening again. The goal is to take away the power of the bully. So listed on your slide are five different reactions to the bullying. The first one, educate the bully. Provide the bully with information. Tell the bully a brief statement about your disability or your difference. For example, when a child with a learning disability is called stupid, they can respond by telling the bully, I have difficulty reading, but I am working hard to improve it. This is, the best, this is best done on a one-to-one -one situation and, of course, not in a group situation. Agree with the bully. Tell the bully they are absolutely correct and you agree with everything they're saying. For example, when a child with a limp is teased, they can say to the bully, yes, I do walk with a limp. You are right in noticing that. Seek the help of an adult. And uh, under Seek the Help of Adult, it is important to teach your child to locate the nearest adult and to attract their attention and to let the adult know that they need assistance. Do something the bully doesn't anticipate. Yell out so that another child or an adult looks your way. Or keep a whistle with you and blow it loudly. Um, I've had several parents use this technique. Um, a child was able to take a whistle out of their pocket and blow it when they were having some difficulty. This is an, a, a really good technique to use, especially if a child does not have the abilities to communicate verbally. Also, ask the bully to stop. And a lot of times, children don't know that they can do that. Let the bully know that you want them to stop. Tell them that they should not bully you and that this is more effective than children actually really think it is. Generally, it's not a good idea to respond physically or to fight back, and we teach children that that's the case, as this only perpetuates the behavior and can lead to other issues, such as things like suspension or increased physical violence. Calling the parent of the bully should be discouraged. Now, there's different schools of belief in this area, but many people feel that that should be discouraged. The better resource is to work with the school administrators to address the issue or consequences for bullying behavior and to encourage school-wide awareness that bullying is not to be tolerated. Many schools have instituted um, positive power of um, programs that, uh, what we would call PBIS programs, that um, help in this respect. A very important part and something that can help defer bullying is to encourage group involvement. Studies show that children who interact with their peers are less likely to be bullied. Children are familiar with one another on a personal basis, and they're more likely to provide support, empathy, and protection for another student. There are some examples of adult monitored activities um, to help a child increase um, peer interaction and to make them more capable. And I have four of them that I will mention to you at this time. One is to enroll your child in structured activities, such as non-competitive types of activities, maybe a swimming club, a dance class, or some sort of scouting, to join an after-school program or an activity such as karate or an arts and crafts activity, to participate on committees um, or in a group such as the newspaper or homecoming committee if the child is, for example, on a high school level, and to develop a hobby that would allow direct interaction with peers such as a theater activity. It is important for parents to also educate their children about social norms. 
Children who understand social norms are less likely to be socially isolated and are better equipped to respond in a manner that does not provide the bully with what they're looking for, their desired outcome. It's important for parents to be involved at school. When a child is at school, his or her safety is the responsibility of school personnel. Parents can encourage school personnel to protect children from bullying behavior, but it is also important for parents to take an active role in their child's school. Talk with your child's teacher. The teacher needs to know you are concerned about your child's safety and welfare. You should discuss options with the teacher as far as their involvement and to also um, make sure that they understand that your child should have a plan to respond and be able to react toward bullying behavior. Ask to speak to the class about your child's disability. Oftentimes there are parents that will come in and with their child discuss what their particular disability is. To be part of the child's school on a volunteer list or to come in for visits, to join a local parent-teacher organization or offer to speak before the school board in a discussion that surrounds issues and concerns about bullying in the schools. It's important to promote change in the school. Research indicates that creating a supportive school environment is the most important step in preventing harassment. And this comes from the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. Um, so there are multiple programs to promote change in the school. Um, the program of PBIS is one of them. Parents can advocate for school-wide programs to promote bullying awareness and conclude such things as initiating a school-wide assembly to introduce and to discuss bullying issues, to encourage peer interactions, to provide safe zones in schools and create areas that are heavily monitored by adults, trained to recognize all types of bullying behaviors and methods for safe, effective intervention, to develop conflict resolution programs or peer mediation programs if children are able to do so, and to develop a, a class contact that would work with students to establish their own set of rules about how to behave in the classroom, on the playground, and in the hallways, as far as the contracted kinds of behavior. It's important for parents of students who have disabilities and who have individual education plans to use their child's IEP to develop goals and interventions in the IEP to build the skills that prevent bullying and develop methods to intervene against bullying behavior. The IEP can be used as a vehicle for that. So the IEP can include such goals and objectives that address such things as improving social skills such as sharing, taking turns, thinking before acting, developing the ability to carry on a two-way conversation, increase self-advocacy skills and how to learn to say no or to stop that, to identify the practice of direct and indirect ways to react to, handle, and avoid bullying. Also, um, to include such things as the supplementary aids and services and program modifications and supports that would help in such situations as the hallway or the playground, to allow the child to leave class early, to avoid hallway uh, incidents, so leave a minute or two before class actually ends to use such things as social stories to help children understand difficult situations when they occur, to um, provide in-service for staff to understand children's disabilities and their vulnerability, to educate peers about school district policies on bullying behavior, and such things as that. There are laws that apply to disability harassment that are included um, as follows on your screen. Now, um, the laws that um, 
we have here in the state of Wisconsin are, of course, our federal laws, um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of um, 1973 and Title II of the Americans with Disability Act, and also the um, IDEA Act as well. Um, our Pupil Non-Discrimination Act, actually the chapter and the section we have uh, written down there um, is not necessarily correct at this time. Um, it should be Section 118.46. Um, so you might want to correct that on the slide. And these laws apply to disability harassment, um, this particular law. OK, moving on. Laws that apply to disability harassment and the role of school districts in um, disability harassment, or for that matter, in harassment at all. Um, the school has a responsibility uh, to be able to respond in an appropriate matter if harassment does take place. When a child is at school, his or her safety is the responsibility of school personnel, as we stated before, and that school districts have a legal responsibility to respond to disability harassing allegations. The first step for school district is to develop and disseminate an official policy statement prohibiting discrimination based on disability harassment, or for that matter, for harassment at all. And I will uh, discuss those particular things um, at the end of the presentation and also show you the DPI site for bullying and harassment uh, techniques. The school district should widely publicize the anti-harassment statements and procedures for handling discrimination claims by including the anti-discrimination statement in the school and student handbook. Anti-discrimination statements should identify the person to whom complaints of disability discrimination or, for that matter, any kind of unlawful discrimination should be made to and include their title, their business address, and their telephone number. The school district also has the responsibility to respond to disability harassment if and when it does occur by taking effective action to promptly end the harassment, prevent it from recurring again, and where appropriate, addressing the effects on the student who has been harassed. It is important to keep a record of all bullying and harassment situation. When a child is a target of bullying, parents need to document the events and to develop a record for uh, keeping a log of the history. Because if you prove that there's a history of such, there's a responsibility also that the school must have. Parents, as the most invested parties in the situation, should do their best to keep track of all events. In this way, emotions alone do not drive your discussion when you talk to school administration about bullying and harassment. Records can help parents keep a concise, accurate timeline of events. Parents may think that they are going to remember the events, but it is easier to use a written record when referring to the events versus trying to recreate them after they happen. The record can also help in determining if the bullying behavior has increased or decreased in the frequency or the duration. And it is also important to note that um, the record should be factual and based on actual events. Do not add opinions or emotional statements. Data is important. Remember, if it is not in writing, it does not exist. Content, again, content of such reports should include the bullying incident, the date, the person involved, and the child's account of the event, and also all communication with professionals, the date of the communication, the discussion or summary of the event, the responses of the professional, the action taken, and any reports that are filed. There are steps that you can use to notify school administration. And we have 10 of them that we um, have listed here for you. Um, and I will just discuss some of them for you at this time and then move on to the next slide that I just pulled up for you on how to file a complaint. The following are 10 suggested steps 
First of all, it needs to be in writing and address notification to the particular person. And they should have a date on the letter. Write the letter to the person who has the authority to investigate. Note that the school district is the recipient of federal federal uh, financial assistance. So in doing so, they it is their responsibility to be able to make sure that these happenings do not occur. State the past of continuing discriminative, discriminatory activity against your child. State that the school district has control over both the site of the discrimination and of other school personnel involved. Explain that the discrimination was not a single act. Tell how the discrimination excluded your child from continuing participation in school or denying your child the benefits to which other children in school have access. Explain as well as you can what you would like the school to do to stop it. Ask for a copy of the school district grievance policy. And also state that if the person receiving this letter does not investigate or does not take effective corrective action that you may file a claim as far as discrimination is concerned. And so filing a claim is discussed on the next slide for you and how to do so. And you can be able to respond to this later. Um, and there's a list for you. You must file the claim with the school district first. The claim must be in writing. You need to get a copy of your district's complaint policy. And there's a tip there. Send a copy of the complaint to the Office of Civil Rights if this is a civil rights complaint. And then your letter should include the things that we talked about before, the disability of the child, the information and the documentation, and explain um, what you would like to see as what we would call the remedy of that complaint. And um, as a, a sort of a final statement um, here before we take a look at the um, site for DPI and the DPI's uh, law for um, bullying and harassment, um, I'd like to let you know that it is really important for parents to recognize that they are their child's best advocate. And they are the ones that are the most familiar with their strengths and with their abilities, and also with their vulnerabilities. So that's important for us to remember. Let me see now if I can move to the other, um, slide that I wanted to bring up for you. And this is, hopefully you can see that on your screen at this time. If you go to the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction site, they have a comprehensive approach to bully prevention. And the bully prevention information is included for you in that area here. Um, so there's a definition of bullying, and there's all kinds of information listed on this site for you um, as far as a comprehensive bullying resource map, the bullying prevention program assessment tool, preventing bullying, um, preventing uh, some specific kinds of imbalances of power, uh, again, the definition of bullying, also the definition and information on Wisconsin Safe Schools and Healthy Schools Act and the Violence Prevention Program Assessment Tool. Again, the DPI, um, way back in 2000, I believe in 2009, Act 309 was the school safety law that was first put into effect. And then in 2010, every school um, in the state of Wisconsin must have a law that prevents bullying and also harassment. Um, and there's a pupil non-discrimination program as well. All of this information can be accessed through the uh, Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction site. We have not really touched on cyberbullying as much as I would like to. I am hopeful that we will um, establish a complete cyberbullying um, webinar in itself, but there are some related links on the DPI site on cyberbullying here as well that you might want to look at um, when we are done um, with this webinar today. And also there is a cyberbully research center that there's a link there for you as well. So um, at this point in time, 
Um, I don't see that we have any questions. I am hopeful that all of you um, did um, gain some information from our very basic discussion of bullying and harassment. If you have any questions for me or anyone at Wisconsin Facets, please feel free to give us a call and we will be glad to help you out. At this time, this concludes our webinar. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Wisconsin Facets has over 100 scheduled trainings and webinars for 2017. Please feel free to check our website calendar and, rep, uh, and register for any upcoming trainings that you think you'd like to be involved in. And again, please, there will be a short evaluation coming your way after the conclusion of today's webinar. We'd like to urge you to please fill out that evaluation as it will help us to bring you additional webinars um, in the future. I'd like to thank everybody again for their participation. If you need to contact me, my email address is B, and it's, I'll spell it for you, V-A-N-D-E-R-M-E-U-L-E-N -E 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 at W I f a c e t s dot org again thank you everybody for participating and have a wonderful day bye now